This is Sarah with RegisterNurseRN.com and in this video I'm going to be going over seizures. And this video is part of an NCLEX review series over the neuro system. And as always you can access the free quiz at the end of this video to test you on this condition. So let's get started. What are seizures? They occur when abnormal electrical signals are being fired rapidly from neurons in the brain. And we have various types of seizures which we're going to go in detail here in a moment. But you can really put them in two categories. They're either generalized seizures, which means that they're affecting both sides of the brain, or they're focal seizures, also known as partial seizures, and they're affecting really a specific area of the brain. Now in our brain, we have neurons. And what do neurons do? Well, they are tasked with handling and transmitting information. Now when we're talking about seizures, let's remember two types of neurons, excitatory neurons and inhibitory neurons. And just as their name says is really what their role is. Okay, so first, excitatory. Whenever these neurons are stimulated, they will cause a response they'll excite things they will cause something to happen in order to do this they will release the neurotransmitter glutamate now on the flip side inhibitory neurons they're going to inhibit a response decrease it and to achieve this they release the neurotransmitter GABA so in a healthy brain that's not having seizure activity, you have a nice fine balance between excitatory and inhibitory neurons. Now let's say that your inhibitory neurons are damaged. What's gonna happen? Well, excitatory is really just gonna take over and stimulate, overstimulate parts of the brain, sending abnormal signals which will lead to seizure activity. And the whole reason I go over this with you is because whenever we're talking about our anti-seizure medications, one of the medications we're going to talk about is barbiturates. And what they do is they stimulate the GABA receptors, which is going to help decrease the excitation that is going on in this brain because when they're stimulated, those inhibitory neurons are going to release GABA and calm things down in here. So we decrease our seizure activity. So what causes seizures? Well, anyone can have a seizure, adults or children, especially if they are suffering from a severe acute condition or illness. But once that's corrected, cured, whatever, the seizures will stop. And seizures can happen due to like a high fever, a central nervous system infection, like bacterial meningitis, hypoglycemia, where that blood sugar just drops way too low can affect the brain. Because remember, the brain loves sugar and it does not like when it doesn't have a lot of it. Alcohol withdrawal, acid base imbalances like acidosis or conditions that cause hypoxia, and brain tumors. But some patients have what's called epilepsy. And this is where a patient is having frequent seizure activity due to a chronic condition. And this can be due to a traumatic brain injury where they've had severe trauma to that brain. So they're very prone to recurrent seizure activity or congenital birth defect, they were born with this, they've had a massive stroke that has really affected some areas of the brain, or they've had long lasting effects of an illness, like maybe they had a severe case of bacterial meningitis, especially those diseases that affect the central nervous system. Or of course, they really aren't sure why the person is having seizure activity. It's unknown, so idiopathic causes. Now, before we talk about our different types of seizures, let's switch gears and talk about the stages of a seizure. Now, we can divide how a person experiences a seizure into stages. And these stages, keep in mind, vary depending on the seizure type. Because some seizures will have an aura, some will not. Some will have a very fast post-ictus, which is the recovery after the seizure some it will take hours today so keep that in mind so our stages include the prodromal the aura the ictus and the post ictus so first the prodromal this is when symptoms start to appear prior to that big event hence the seizure and what you can see in patients with this is that they will become depressed maybe have anger issues sleeping anxiety gastrointestinal and urinary issues, etc. Now, when do these symptoms start? They tend to start days before a seizure happens. 
So a lot of patients, they start to become aware of what's going on and they will notice this and they will be able to prep themselves for a possible seizure. Next is aura. And like I said before, not all patients are gonna go through this stage, the aura phase. But what patients tend to have an aura? Well, patients who experience focal seizures, also called the partial seizures, or the tonic-clonic seizures, which is those generalized type of seizures. And it tends to happen at the very beginning of the seizure. And we're talking about within seconds or minutes before that seizure happens. So it's different than the prodromal, which happens days. So the aura is a warning sign that a bigger seizure is expected. So what can the patient report? And this really varies on patients. So as the nurse taking care of a patient who has a history of epilepsy, you want to ask them what is the typical aura for them, what do they experience so you can be prepared for it as well. Um, some patients report an altered vision or hearing. They can see spots in their vision, squiggly lines, or they can actually start hearing certain sounds that aren't there like voices. They can have this sudden anxiety or dread, deja vu, a sudden weird taste or smell. They can become dizzy or have the inability to speak. And if your patient starts to experience any of these signs and symptoms, you want to take them seriously and you want to help the patient prep, which we're going to go over in our nursing interventions. The next stage is the ictus stage, and this is the actual seizure. The word ictus means seizure. And most seizures tend to last between one to three minutes. And the reason I point this out is because as the nurse, you want to always time the seizure because seizures greater than five five minutes or if they start to have seizures back to back like two or more the patient has entered into a condition called status epilepticus and this is dangerous because it's very unlikely that the seizure is going to stop all by itself and that the patient needs immediate medical treatment like medication to actually stop it and the last stage is the post ictus and just as the name says it's after the seizure. So this is the recovery part. This is where the brain takes time to recover. Now, this varies, like I said before, depending on the seizure type. For instance, with the tonic-clonic, which is one of the most severe types of seizures, it can take hours to days for the patient to recover. But if it's an absent type seizure, which is also a generalized seizure, it can be immediate. Now, what can a patient report whenever they've had, let's say, like a tonic-clonic seizure afterwards? They will be very tired. They'll want to sleep. And as the nurse, you want them to sleep. They can be confused. They won't remember what happened. They can have a headache or have injury to themselves because during the seizure, they could have bit their tongue, their cheek, or hurt a body part. And the biting of the tongue and the cheek um, can happen mainly in the tonic-clonic seizures. Now let's talk about the different types of seizures. Okay, at the beginning of the lecture, I told you there were two categories of seizures. We have generalized, which again affect the whole brain, both sides of the brain, or you can have focal seizures, also called partial seizures, that affect a specific side of the brain. So first, let's talk about generalized seizures, and we're gonna talk about the most common type of generalized seizure, which is called the tonic-clonic seizure formerly referred to as grand mal seizure. Now, whenever a person thinks of someone having a seizure, this is really what they think of. And what happens typically with this seizure is that these patients tend to have that aura, that warning sign beforehand. So if your patient has a history of this, they tell you that, what are you going to do? You're going to act on that and you're going to get them safe. You're going to lie them down on their side why on their side, not on their back? Because that will help the tongue go to the side instead of going back and blocking the airway. Also will help saliva or any potential blood drain out of the mouth as well. And then you're gonna cushion their head with a pillow. Now, how it usually progresses that is that the patient loses consciousness. Why we wanna get them down that line position on their side because they're at risk for injury. Then they will progress to the tonic part of the seizure which is where tonic is where you have muscle stiffening. So the whole body is just gonna stiffen. And some patients, whenever this happens, they can groan, cry out because respiratory muscles, everything is just literally becoming really hard and stiff. 
They can also bite their tongue or the inside of their cheek. So you may see blood coming out of their mouth with saliva as well, like foaming out of the mouth. So that's what that's from. And also from where the respiratory effort is very impaired because of all the body stiffening, they will have apnea and cyanosis. They can be, become bluish where they're not breathing. Then a couple seconds, few seconds later, they'll go into the clonic part of the seizure where they have this recurrent jerking. So it's like spas, relaxation, spasm, relaxation, spasm. And it's just jerking of the extremities. And the patient can also experience incontinence during this part where they can lose control of their bowels or their urinary system. Now, how long should a seizure last? Remember that number? One to three minutes. So you're timing that as the nurse. Anything greater than five minutes, what are they possibly entering into? Status epilepticus, which is dangerous because a seizure may not stop on their own. And with tonic-clonic seizures, they are definitely at risk for status epilepticus. So remember that. And if that does happen, you're in the hospital setting, you want to initiate your emergency response system, whatever you have, so you can get a team in there to help you give medications to stop this seizure. Now during the post-ictus after the seizure, what, what's your patient gonna look like? Well, they're probably not even gonna remember what happened. They're not gonna recall the event. They're gonna be very tired. They'll want to sleep. They'll be sore from where they had the stiffening of the body and the clonic part of the seizure. And they can report a headache. And some other types of generalized seizures that really tie in with the tonic-clonic is that they can have just a tonic seizure where they have the body stiffening only and they're at risk for injury with that or they can just have the clonic seizure where they have the reoccurrent jerking and it can either be symmetrical or it can be asymmetrical. Another type of seizure is called an absent seizure, formerly known as petit mal. And this tends to be more common in the pediatric patients, the children. And just as its name says, it's absent. So the signs and symptoms aren't gonna be as pronounced as say to that tonic clonic seizure we just talked about. A hallmark finding in this type of seizure is staring, which appears that the patient or the child is daydreaming. Daydreams a lot, so they're just staring off. And because of this, a lot of people may not notice that this child is having a seizure, so it can go unnoticed for a while. So whenever they do it, they won't respond to you just like someone who's really daydreaming. You gotta snap them out of it, but they're not gonna respond to you. And if they are doing an activity, they'll stop doing the activity and then once the episode, the event is over, they'll actually continue doing the activity that they stop. So it's very short, like seconds long. So again, as you can see, that's why it goes unnoticed for a while. During the post-ictus phase after the seizure, it's immediate, they recover immediately, not hours to days like our tonic-clonic, but they're not going to remember this event of happening. Another type of generalized seizure is called a tonic also called drop attacks, and here in a moment you will know why it's called drop attack. So let the name help you, tonic. Whenever we were talking about tonic-clonic, the tonic part, what was happening? They had increased muscle tone because they were having body stiffening. When we put an A in front of that word, it means without, without muscle tone. So these patients go limp. So if the patient is standing, they will actually fall. Now, what's one of the heaviest parts on our body, our head? So what is going to hit the floor when we fall? This head, so they're at risk for head trauma. Or if they're sitting, they're going to slump over. Our head is really at risk. So in the plan of care with these patients, because children can suffer from these as well, you want to incorporate them wearing a helmet because a lot of times they're not gonna know that this is gonna happen. They're just going to randomly go limb and that head needs to be protected. During this type of seizure, the patient is not aware of their surroundings. And in the post-ictus after the seizure, it's re the recovery is immediate once they regain consciousness. Now let's look at our focal seizures, also called partial seizures. We have two types. We have focal onset aware, also known as simple partial, and then we have focal impaired awareness, also called complex partial. Okay, first let's talk about this one. 
With this, the symptoms vary depending on where the seizure activity is. It tends to affect a small area of a lobe. So for instance, if it's in the occipital lobe, the patient may have vision changes. So it's location dependent on what you're gonna see in your patient. Now the thing to remember to help you differentiate between these two is that in this one, the focal onset aware, the simple partial, the patient is going to be aware of their surroundings whenever this event is taking place, which in this type, the complex partial, the focal, focal impaired awareness, they're not aware. Now a lot of times this simple partial is referred to as the aura because it's short, lasts like less than two minutes, and sometimes it starts here and it can transpire and form into a complex partial where it can actually extend and go here. So a lot of times when patients have this complex partial seizure, they will have the aura before it, this type of seizure. So the focal impaired awareness seizure, the patient is unaware, so they're not aware of their surroundings, but they also will have motor symptoms where they're not gonna have that up here. And these motor symptoms are called automatisms, which is like an activity that they're doing automatically without being aware that they're doing it. Like they're lip smacking, or they're rubbing their hands together, or they're trying to grasp for something that isn't there. And these type of seizures tend to most commonly arise in the temporal lobe. Now let's talk about nursing interventions. Okay, as a nurse, one of the things we wanna do is we wanna assess our patient load and we wanna ask ourselves, is any of our patients at risk for seizures? Because just because you're not working on a neuro floor, that doesn't mean that you're not gonna get patients who can have seizures. It can happen to anyone. Because let's say you're working on a cardiac floor, the patient's there because they have a dysrhythmia, you're helping treat that, but the patient's also withdrawing from alcohol. So they're at risk for seizures. So you wanna put them in seizure precautions. Now, what does that entail? Well, number one, you wanna make sure that your oxygen and your suction is hooked up and ready to go if you need it. You wanna make sure that that patient has IV access and that that IV access works because you may be giving some anti-seizure medication. You want to make sure that the bed rails are padded. You can get this usually from supply, put those, attach those to the bed, because if they start having, let's say, a tonic-clonic seizure, they're moving their extremities and their legs, they can really bruise them, possibly even fracture them if your patient has like bone issues on that railing and their head as well. Make sure that the bed is in the lowest position possible. Have a pillow at that head to protect it. Remove all restrictive clothing or objects that could cause issues. And we want to assess and see, does that patient have a history of seizures? Do they have epilepsy? And if so, ask them about it. Um, do they go through the prodromal stage? If so, what are those signs and symptoms? Do they have auras? If so, what are their signs and symptoms so you can be prepared? And if they do have auras, how fast does that seizure happen whenever that aura happens? So they'll give you an idea how fast you need to act. How long do the seizures normally last? So if they have a seizure and their seizure normally lasts a minute, you can time it while they're having one and make sure that, okay, this is how long it usually lasts. And what type of seizure do they normally have? So you can be on the lookout for that. Another thing is to ask the patient, when did you take your seizure medication? If they do take seizure medications, because a lot of times these patients are coming to you, you have to get that medication history. And one of the triggers of a seizure, as you're gonna learn in a moment, is being under medicated. Because a lot of these seizure medications have to maintain a proper drug level in order for the drug to work. So you'll wanna look at that and Look at those drug levels when those labs are drawn. Take a look at those. Are they within normal range? Now let's talk about what your role is during that actual seizure. Okay, we want to protect our patient because what we've learned is that injury can happen with this. They can fall, they can hurt themselves. So if you can, if they have a warning sign, you want to easily get that patient on their side. And we discussed why the side, because that helps move the tongue to the side, will help any extra saliva blood come out of the mouth instead of pulling back in the throat. So we wanna help with that. And also with the pillow under the head. Do not restrain the patient because this can hurt them if we do that. Also hurt yourself. 
Do not insert anything in the patient's mouth at all. Remove any restrictive items on the patient, like I just said. Also think about those eyeglasses. They can come off, they can break, cause damage as well. And a big thing that I've been hitting on, you want to time that seizure. We don't want the seizure to be greater than five minutes or if they're having multiple seizures back to back because they're at risk for what? Status epilepticus. And if that happens, you'll want to activate your emergency response system. If you're timing and that seizure is greater than five minutes, you need to do that. Because regardless, you're gonna be notifying this physician of this seizure. But if that status epilepticus does happen, the patient needs treatment fast. And another thing you're gonna be doing simultaneously while doing all this other stuff is you're gonna mentally be noting the characteristics of that seizure before it happens and during it. Like for instance, did the patient have an aura? What did they report? Or they're having prodromal symptoms? What did they report? And then the actual seizure happened. Did they cry out? Did they experience that stiffening of the body? And then a little bit later, a couple seconds later, they had the jerking, the clonic part. So it was tonic clonic, or maybe they just had the tonic signs and symptoms or the clonic. They had blood in their mouth where they bit their tongue or their cheek or they were incontinent. All of those important little details helps the doctor know, hey, what kind of seizure was this based on what you seen during the seizure? And if you didn't witness the seizure, you want to be asking those questions to maybe the nurse, nurse's aide or the family members or whoever was in that patient's room during the seizure. And of course, as the nurse, you want to try to be as calm as possible, reassure that patient. Family members who are in there who are probably scared half to death if this was like the first seizure that the person has experienced. So as the nurse, you really want to make sure you're doing that as well. Now let's talk about what you're gonna be doing after the seizure. Okay, the most obvious thing is you wanna make sure that your patient is stable. How's their vital signs, especially that airway because it can become compromised during that seizure. Are they breathing better? Doing a neuro assessment. And you're really wanting to pay attention to how your patient is behaving because as we learn with the different types of seizures and all those stages, certain seizures will cause a patient to act differently in the post-ictus phase. So be asking yourself that. Another thing after notifying the doctor, you may be given orders to draw blood, especially if they're on a seizure medication and they have a seizure, you wanna check blood levels or look at other lab work. Maybe giving medications and the physician may order an EEG. An EEG assesses the brain activity. Think of it like this. We always talk about EKGs. EKG assesses that electrical activity in the heart. EEG is assessing the electrical, electrical activity on the brain. They place these electrodes in certain spots of the brain with the sticky glue stuff and it looks at the brain's activity. So some things you wanna remember about it is it's painless. If your patient asks you that, it doesn't hurt. You will not allow the patient to have caffeine, a stimulant prior to the test, about eight hours prior. In addition, holding seizure medications and other stimulants, they can affect the test because, you know, we don't want a patient to have a seizure, but if they're gonna have a seizure, it's great for them to have a seizure during an EEG. So they can look at that, see exactly what's going on, where it's coming from. So we want to give them their seizure medications after the test. They can eat before the test, just no caffeine, so don't let them have their cup of coffee with their breakfast. Also, you'll want to make sure that the patient's hair is cleaned, it's been washed and dried, because these little electrodes have to stick on the scalp. And if the patient has oily hair that hasn't been washed in a while, you're gonna have a lot of problem getting those electrodes to stick. So help that technician out, and make sure that patient's hair is clean before sending them down for their EEG. In addition, you'll want to look at the order and make sure you're doing the right prep work because there's different types of EEGs. And if you're not aware, you can always call the department because they're really helpful in helping. And you need to make sure, does this patient, are they allowed to sleep before the exam? Because sometimes they don't want them to sleep the night before or only sleep half of the night. So always look at that. Now let's talk about some education pieces you can provide to your patient about things that can cause a seizure. Because you want to be educated them to avoid these things because if they do these things it can increase the risk of actually having a seizure. 
So to help us remember seizure triggers, let's remember the mnemonic STOP seizure. So our first S is stress. Stress can cause seizures. T for trauma. O for overexertion. P for period, pregnancy, really anything that changes hormones, causes hormone shifts, even ovulation in your female patients can cause a seizure. The other S, sleep loss. E for electrolyte and metabolic issues like hypoglycemia. So really warn your patients who are diabetic who have seizure issues like epilepsy that they always make sure that their blood sugar is good. Acidosis, dehydration, so making sure that they're drinking plenty of fluids, especially in hot weather. I for illness. Z for visualization disturbances. And this can be like sounds. Certain sounds can trigger seizures in patients. Also, lights like strobe lights can do this as well, or even certain smells. So anything that's really stimulating those senses can cause seizures. U for under medicated, again, maybe they're not compliant with their medications or they haven't been going to get their drug levels checked, which you really wanna stress that to your patients, the importance of going in, getting that blood drawn so they can make sure that they're therapeutic. And then R for recreational drugs, tell your patients to avoid these. And then E for alcohol. Tell your patients to avoid drinking alcohol because that can also lead to seizures as well. Now let's switch gears and let's do a quick overview of the most common medications used to treat seizures, epilepsy. Okay, the first drugs we're gonna talk about is called barbiturates. And a popular barbiturate is called phenobarbital. And it's used to treat the tonoclonic seizures, which is the generalized seizures, or focal seizures. It can also be used to treat status epilepticus. Now, how does it work? Now, think back to that quick review I had done over the pathophysiology. And what they do is they stimulate the GABA receptors, so those inhibitory neurons and this helps with inhibitory neurotransmission so you're going to decrease the excitement going on in the brain now some side effects that the patient can have are drowsiness ataxia where they really are uncoordinated and um, as a nurse what you want to do whenever you're giving this medication you need to really watch out for respiratory depression and hypotension so be looking at that and drug level maintenance to maintain this drug and therapeutic levels is 15 to 40 micrograms per, per milliliter. Another drug category is called the high dantoins. And a popular drug is called phenytoin. And it's used in tonic, clonic, or focal seizures. And the patient wants to watch out for gingival hyperplasia. Because what can happen is that the gums can enlarge and bleed easily. So as a nurse, you want to assess their gums. You want to tell the patient to have really good mouth care. Also, it can cause bone marrow suppression. So you want to watch those platelets and white blood cells and have the patient regularly assess their skin for rashes because this medication can also cause, cause Steven Johnson syndrome and they'll need to report that to their doctor. When you give this medication, you don't want to give it with milk or antacid because this interferes with the absorption. And a therapeutic phenytonin level is 10 to 20 micrograms per milliliter. Next, we have the benzodiazepines. And this is used to treat absent seizures, tonic-clonic seizures, or focal seizures. And some popular ones are like diazepam or lorazepam. And these are used a lot in status epilepticus because they're fast acting. Now, a side effect is that they can cause the patient to feel very drowsy. They can also, if they've been used a lot on that patient, the patient can develop tolerance where that medication just isn't really as effective as it used to be. It can also impair the liver, so you want to monitor for that, look at their liver studies. And the reversal agent for benzodiazepines is flumazenil. And anytime you're giving these medications, you just want to make sure that you have that on hand to easily give that if you do give these medications in case toxicity or something happens where you can reverse the side effects. In addition, valproates can be used like valproic acid 
and it can be used for all types of seizures, but it can cause liver issues, so monitor the liver, as well as white blood cells, platelets, and educate the patient about potential GI issues as well. Now let's quickly talk about treatments other than medications that can be used for seizures. One thing, of course, is surgery. This is where they can remove an area of the brain that's causing the seizure, like in focal seizures, where there's that specific area. They can go in, remove part of the temporal lobe, like a temporal lobectomy. In addition, when medications aren't working, they can put in an electrical device that sends electrical signals to the vagus nerve called a vagus nerve stimulator. And lastly, another treatment that can be used specifically in the pediatric patient who has epilepsy is called the ketogenic diet. And this is used when the seizures are not controlled by medication. And they can follow a diet, it's a very, very special specialized where they consume foods that are high in fat and low in carbs, and this can actually decrease seizure activity. Okay, so that wraps up this review over seizures. Thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to take the free quiz and to subscribe to our channel for more videos.